Hi, everybody. Welcome to Critical Cataloging, Introducing Local Headings. This is a presentation by myself and Elizabeth McKinley from the Chicago History Museum for the Chicago Area Archivist Virtual Conference, Hindsight is 2020, Lessons Learned and Steps Taken on October 29th, 2021. My name is Elizabeth McKinley, and I'm the Technical Services Librarian at the Chicago History Museum. I've been at CHM since 2019, and I handle the cataloging and acquisitions of the Research Center's uh, published material, which includes ephemera, newspapers, pamphlets, uh, and monographs, among other items. And my name is Gretchen Niethart. I'm the Cataloging and Metadata Librarian. I've been at CHM since 2015. And I handle uh, the cataloging and metadata for our archival materials, which includes paper items, um, prints and photographs, and architecture. And yeah, we're really excited to talk to you all today. So first off, we wanted to introduce the concept of critical cataloging for anyone who may not be familiar with it. Um, and if you are, we hope you learn something new. Um, but this is a movement that goes by many names, um, including ethical cataloging, radical cataloging, preparative description, et cetera. You may have heard it referred to by any of those or multiple of those. This generally stems from the critical librarianship movement. And we have a definition here from critlib.org that I really like which um, calls critical librarianship a movement of library workers dedicated to bringing social justice principles into our work in libraries. We aim to engage in discussion about critical perspectives on library practice, recognizing that we all work under regimes of white supremacy, capitalism, and a range of structural inequalities. How can our work as librarians intervene in and disrupt those systems? So when we talk about critical cataloging, we're talking about applying that to cataloging and description. Um, some of you may have heard me talk about this before. I have had some discussions at a Chicago Area Archivists um, CA Reacts panel, as well as other local discussions. But just as a quick recap, I wanted to talk about why we were interested in doing this at the Chicago History Museum. Um, this stems a little bit from another giant, giant project, which was a retro conversion of our uh, archives and manuscripts card catalog. Uh, most of our archives and manuscripts collections were already described online, but we had a large chunk of small manuscripts that never made the jump from catalog card uh, to mark record. And in the course of transcribing those descriptions, many of those catalog cards were written in the 20s, the 30s, 40s, 50s, and lots of the descriptions, as you can imagine, were not amazing. Um, many of them, in accordance with, with practice at the time, actually the descriptions were excerpts from the items themselves. So this was particularly egregious when talking about items describing various aspects of slavery. So seeing that language and knowing we certainly did not want to transcribe that, we wanted something that reduced that harm to any casual researcher who came upon these item descriptions. Um, that's when we started investigating this. And I will also say that the goals for this project, especially as a history museum, is not to erase that that history existed or that that was the terminology that even we as librarians used, much less people at the time. We wanna preserve that information, that's important. But at the same time, we do believe very strongly in harm reduction, particularly for folks trying to research themselves and their own histories. Um, so that that is what has gotten us thinking about critical cataloging. So after a brief overview and timeline of the work at CHM, um, after some planning and research, our critical, critical cataloging work began in the summer of 2019. One of our first projects was changing illegal aliens to non-citizens. And this switch was originally recommended by the Library of Congress in 2016. However, the House of Representatives opposed this change. They introduced a bill that would force 
Library of Congress to retain illegal aliens as a subject heading um, because they argued that it matched the term used in legal code. That was the reasoning. But CHM joined other institutions in disregarding that bill um, and the House and uh, made the decision to implement the change non-citizens um, and in some cases undocumented immigrants. Around the same time, we began making changes to slavery related language, relying heavily on P. Gabrielle Foreman's community source document, writing about slavery, teaching about slavery. And based on recommendations made in this document and those made by the Triangle Research Libraries Network, we made, uh, I'm sorry, we changed instances of slaves to enslaved persons. In 2020, despite the limitations, um, brought on by the pandemic, we were fortunate to expand our projects and involve more museum staff, community members, and students. We welcomed four Northwestern interns and five short-term New York Historical Society research associates, all of whom were extremely invaluable to this work. They assessed the language used in our catalog records and metadata and helped draft three research guides. One was related to indigenous studies, another on Latino, Latina, and Latinx studies, and the third related to Black and African American identity terms and history. CHM Research Center staff also began addressing disability related language, and most of this work involved catching up with Library of Congress's subject headings and updating archaic subject headings that were still in our um, online catalog. But we also made changes to language in summary descriptions when possible and added disclaimers where necessary. And a research guide on disability st studies culminated from this work as well. Um, and the work has continued this year. Uh, for example, we changed or in some in instances contextualized language we use whenever Chicago's incorporation day is celebrated, which in the past um, has often been referred to as Chicago's birthday. We hosted an intern from Dominican University who helped publish an LGBTQIA studies research guide. We continued our partnership with Northwestern's Chicago Humanities Initiative and welcomed two interns who helped examine language related to class and poverty and South Asian American studies. And one of our practicum students from UIUC began analyzing information resources about women in CHM's collections to correctly identify them by their first name or uh, pre-marriage names, maiden names. And finally, we introduced and publicized more local headings, focusing on language changes regarding non-citizens, undocumented in immigrants, enslaved persons, poor persons, indigenous people, and LGBTQIA um, people and communities. And the work does not stop there, of course, and we have many future goals, uh, some of which include uh, digitizing and transcribing documents helpful for genealogy. Um, and, that, and part of that work would be naming partially or completely unnamed people of underrepresented, un, underrepresented groups. Um, another goal is a style guide for the museum at large, um, and also to continue naming women, especially um, going through our portraits and trying to identify the women in those portraits. So for this presentation, we're focusing uh, more specifically on the local headings um, and those changes that we've made, but please feel free to reach out to us um, if you have any questions about any of the projects I mentioned. So one question we're often asked is, what are the best practices for approaching a critical cataloging plan? And unfortunately, I don't have an absolute answer to give you. Um, I think this is really important to decide institutionally. Um, you need to think about who your audience is and what do they need and want and work backwards from there. Um, for instance, thinking about the Chicago History Museum, our audience is everyone who's in Chicago, interested in Chicago history, formerly lived in Chicago, um, and thinking about the research center, we have an even bigger audience because we often get a lot of national and international scholars who are interested in Chicago history topics. Um, that certainly makes planning a little bit difficult, 
But in other ways, it makes it easy. We know that we need to be approachable in our descriptions to Chicagoans, particularly Chicagoans who have not been as considered in archives, um, because we want to be welcoming to them and to their discovery of their own history. Um, it's also very important to think about your staff size and your collection size and what is feasible. This is a particular concern for us um, as you are talking or viewing the only cataloging staff at CHM, Elizabeth and I. So between the two of us, um, we, we do a lot of critical cataloging work, but we also have to do a lot of general regular maintenance work. Um, we also both do reference and many other activities. So we have to really carefully consider what, what can we build into our time? What do we have time for? Um, and that's unfortunately a limitation for us, particularly when our collection size is much larger. It's large in comparison to our staff. Um, I will say we are very lucky and that we are very supported by our own research and access department, as well as the collection staff and the education staff and the museum staff at large. Um, that's been very helpful for us. But I encourage you to think about your own institutional weaknesses and institutional strengths as you're doing this work. Um, perhaps you have an institution that already has a really great relationship with the community that your holdings are about. Um, so they can be great resources and telling you how they want to be described, telling you how they want to find out about themselves. Um, maybe you are an institution who does not have a great relationship yet with the folks described in your collections, in which case I would encourage you to prioritize making those relationships a reality. Um, that's certainly a factor for us. Um, and one of the things that we are always working on is trying to create and strengthen and maintain those social relationships. You've certainly heard this advice before, but I also would encourage you to break what are really large projects into small pieces that are achievable. Um, when I started thinking about this work, it seemed completely insurmountable. Um, thinking about you know all the collections we had, all the descriptions, all of the different formats of those descriptions. And so taking this a piece at a time has made this much more doable. Um, and similar to that, you know, what we've also been working on at CHM is incorporating this work as part of just our general operating work, not as a project. So in some ways, it was easier to go ahead and get this started and, you know, get permission to do this work when we describe it as as a project and think about it as a project. Um, but I truly believe that this work should be built into your description work. And that's what we're building towards here. Lastly, I encourage you to just get started. You will be shocked at the momentum you build if you just begin on one piece and build from there. Um, of course, in an ideal world, we all would have been doing much of this work already, but we all have to start somewhere. Um, please, you know, we encourage you to reach out to us, to reach out to others. Um, I personally think that there's a really amazing community on Twitter of critical cataloging librarians and archivists. Um, so, and they have been incredibly receptive when I have questions or, or run into an issue. Um, but, but getting started, I think, is the most important part while also documenting what you are doing um, since, especially as you are in your very early stages, you likely are gonna go down one path and you might change your mind about what you wanted to do about that. Um, Elizabeth mentioned one of our very first changes was um, the our legal aliens heading. Um, and we changed course on what we wanted to change those to. So our first uh, route was to strictly follow the Library of Congress recommendations. Um, and then we saw what that other institutions had adopted some slightly different phrasing that was a little less stilted. So for instance, um, non-citizens to uh, undocumented immigrants, and that, that's a simplification of that change, but we decided we liked you know, the latter change more. So that's when we started following the guidelines for this Cascade Alliance instead. 
But part of what made it so easy for us to switch courses was that we had so heavily documented anything we had changed. So we could very easily go back and say, actually, I would rather do this instead. Um, so I cannot emphasize the importance of documentation enough, which you all, all know already because you're all amazing archivists. So one of our biggest pieces of advice is to record all changes you make and know when and why a decision was made, what was changed and what was affected. Um, as we know, language is fluid and it's very likely changes made now will need to be revisited and revised down the line. So it's important to have the information on hand. Also recording changes will, will make it easier to share information, sources and workflow with others. Um, for us personally, Excel workbooks have been an effective way to track our work. And um, for example, the workbook may have a column with the original term, um, a column with the recommended change, a column for the source um, that we referred to, um, to note that recommendation, and then any questions or notes we have for ourselves. And then we also note the changes in the bib record and authority record. Um, so if we wanted to refer um, to a specific subject heading, we will see when the change was made um, and by who and the source that we referred to. That being said, different techniques work for others. Um, so it really depends on the material you're working with and the system you're using and what workflow works best for you. As we've mentioned, a lot of the work done has been thanks to the help and expertise of interns, students, volunteers, staff, community members. And rather than assigning projects to folks who are helping us, we tried to design projects around their interests. Um, we've quickly realized that working with people's strengths and interests make for really meaningful projects. When it comes time to updating terms in your system, Mark Edit and Excel are great tools for making batch changes. Um, for example, after exporting records based on keyword searches, you can use Mark Edit to find and replace terms and then um, import it back into your system. Open Refine is another option depending on your volume. Um, scripting also works if you have large changes or want to make changes to something like EAD XML. So now I get to talk to you about our nitty gritty logistics. Um, before I dive into this slide, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on how Chicago History Museum generally builds their record descriptions. Um, so we most frequently start in Mark. Um, so that you'll notice, maybe you will, maybe you won't, depending on how familiar you are with Mark. Um, you'll notice these instructions are specific to that. So for the most part today, what we are talking about is how we introduce local Mark authorities. Um, that being said, I think that this work is very transferable to other sorts of systems. So you can easily transfer what we're doing here to EAD control access tags. Um, you can easily transfer it to other types of systems like TMS or Pass Perfect. Um, I have worked with a few different systems with this. So if you have any questions about logistics uh, in other systems beyond Mark, I'm happy to try to answer them. Um, but in Mark, these are our four steps. These are in our standard instructions uh, and our procedures, which we do post publicly. So you can see those. There's a link at the bottom of the screen. Um, and if you see the local headings box in our critical cataloging libguide, that's where these instructions live. Um, along with a spreadsheet of the changes we have already made, which Elizabeth will talk about in a little bit. Um, but we always make sure we change the fixed field to indicate that we've switched something from Library of Congress to a local heading. Um, we always add the new heading. Generally, it's a 150 for a topic, but it could be something else. So we've kept that general here, um, but we add the new 150, there can only be 150 per record. We add the new term there and we 
make sure to indicate using the subfield two that it's a local heading, um, unless what we're doing is replacing a Library of Congress term with another um, already approved vocabulary like Homosaurus, in which case we would use the subfield two Homo IT uh, code. And this link takes you to the entire list of <laughs> all the codes you could possibly use. So you can, from there, you can also see all the alternative vocabularies. Um, we put the legacy or original 100 into a 400. So um, a C that makes it a C from tracing. And we add a subfield W with these, with A and E, which indicates that this is a former heading and it's not to be publicly displayed. Uh, lastly, we add a 667 note, which is an internal note um, with some kind of template of this. This is the language template. We may change it, but basically we want to capture um, what was changed, when we changed it, who changed it, and why we changed it. Um, this is to help us again with our internal documentation so we can always kind of leave some breadcrumbs for ourselves to say when this changed and why. Um, sometimes though this node is only changing a C from or C also tracing, not necessarily the, the main heading. So we'll, we may adjust the language there. Um, and our, this next slide, this will show you the actual, an actual real life mark authority record um, that I screenshotted just recently. Uh, so you can see uh, in the fixed field data 800 and the first column, the third one down, subject has been changed to Z to indicate this is a local heading. Our practice is not to make a totally new Mark Authority file, but to superimpose our changes over the existing one. And we like to do it this way um, so that we keep all this legacy data, including you know, Library of Congress tracing numbers. Um, we keep all these C from and C also tracings, and we keep the original source data. Um, and we like to do this because most of these changes are one to one substitutions. So this makes it very clear for us, like what were we substituting for? It also makes it much easier for us to search our system and to find these again. Um, but you can also see the other changes here are in the 150. Uh, we've put in a subfield seven to say that this is a local. Um, we change the term from illegal aliens to undocumented immigrants. And we've added this illegal aliens was the 150. It is now a 450. And like I said, with the introduction of the W subfield, this means that this is now can labeled as a former heading. Uh, and you can also see it has a, an additional former heading. This is from before, um, where I guess a previous former heading was also aliens, legal status laws, et cetera. And this particular example, you can see in our internal note at the bottom, the changes we made, where we pulled those changes from. And we also have this additional note that we changed a C also tracing from aliens to non-citizens. So that's this one here. And if you, if this were live, and if I were to click through to this main authority record for non-citizens, it would show you um, a similar note to this. So it would also have this note there, and it would have um, aliens in a C from former heading as well. Um, I will say for a couple, there's a couple of instances where we don't make all of these changes. Um, and that will be if we are introducing, if we are using an approved Library of Congress heading, but in an unapproved way. Um, so the main place this has come up is with Indigenous Peoples. Um, so Indigenous Peoples is an accepted Library of Congress heading. Um, however, we are using it to substitute for the, you know, Indians of continent, <laughs> um, which is, not the approved Library of Congress way to use it. So just as a quick example of what that means, um, in the fixed field data, we would not change this to a Z because the main subject is still coming from Library of Congress. 
in the 150, we would not have a seven or the local because it's not a like local phrase. And what that looks like is a is indigenous peoples. And instead of indigenous peoples of X, Y, Z, it will say indigenous peoples, and then it will have a geographic subdivision uh, that says North America, South America, et cetera. Um, and then we still include the C from 450. So this would still say, you know, Indians of North America, former heading. And we also would have the 667 note at the bottom, which indicates what we were changing and why, since we still are using this, like I said, in a local way. Um, one thing that we are happy to talk about in the Q&A session is we have recently run into a stumbling block where we have kept the same backend cataloging system, but we have a new front end system. And in our old front end system, whenever someone searched any phrase, so if someone still came to us and was searching the phrase illegal aliens, anything tagged with this subject heading and documented immigrants would still show up in the results because the system was smart enough that it could read the C from in the same authority file and still return anything tagged with undocumented immigrants. Unfortunately, our new system does not work like that. It only searches what shows up in the bibliographic record, not the authority record. So the only thing that would show up in the bibliographic record is this phrase undocumented immigrants. Um, and while we hope more and more people use that vernacularly instead of illegal aliens, we know that won't be the case um, and that people have all kinds of different phrases they use. And we, you know, that's just not, that's not a world we live in right now. Um, so, but we also don't wanna hinder discoverability. So we're trying to think of some alternative solutions. So that may be applying illegal aliens as a non-displayed 690 or local heading. Um, it may be adding a non-displayed local note. Uh, we, we have to figure that out. We know we will certainly be using the automation tasks uh, available to us through tools like Mark Edit so that we're not manually changing every single bibliographic record. Um, but we have to do some thinking about the best ways to do that. So, uh, you know, we also welcome your thoughts on that during the Q&A, but we are very frustrated to have very recently discovered that that's the case and are trying to work our way through that. And it's important for us to emphasize that when assigning local headings, we look to the work of others. Um, Gretchen and I are not subject experts and we don't choose these terms on our own. We've made our changes based on recommendations made by uh, working groups, members of the community, other networks, et cetera. For example, for undocumented immigrants, we referred to the Orbis Cascade Alliance recommendations, changes to uh, changes from Indians to indigenous peoples was based on Manitoba Archival Information Network's Library of Congress subject heading working group recommendations. Language related to poor people and enslaved persons was based on the Triangle Research Libraries Network recommendations and Terms relating to LGBTQ people and queer culture came from Homosaurus, which is a linked data vocabulary. Of course, these um, lists will not reflect every single heading that appears in CHM's catalog. So in those instances where we do make a change, which may not directly tie back to one of the lists, we will note in, um, or we'll use the language in the note that says it's based on recommendations made by whichever network we're referring to. Yes, I will say um, also for this project, um, we have we we have to <laughs> think very carefully about what we are doing. Um, and so we try to be very considerate of the groups who's, who we are talking about. Um, so it is really important to us to also offer avenues for feedback. Um, so one of the things we've done is we have added a form that goes in the footer of our any page 
uh, on our online catalog where people can provide feedback to us. Um, they can also provide feedback about you know, typos, other things, anything you might get feedback about in your catalog records. Um, but we also just try to encourage and present ourselves as being as open as possible um, to feedback. I will say, even though we were talking mostly about MARC records today, um, we, we do also change these phrases and language in other aspects of our descriptions. Um, so I make sure our controlled vocabulary terms in any of our finding needs also get changed. Um, we also largely have made many of these changes in the descriptions of our items elsewhere. So in like the summaries, um, we are not as caught up on that as we are with the authorities because we can change the authorities all at once, whereas those are one, one by one. Um, but that is, those are all things we consider. Um, so lastly, we just also wanted to share some resources with you. Uh, we do have a local group that meets to discuss local headings. Um, it's a pretty small and informal group right now. We meet roughly quarterly. Um, but if that's something you're interested in, please contact either of us. We're happy to add you to that. Um, you know, at this point, it is just a very informal resource for us to share out what local changes we've been making, what local changes we're thinking about making, you know, if we have questions, if we have issues, it's, it's a good sounding board place. Um, as I mentioned, critlib.org is a great website and they maintain a live Twitter feed of any post tagged with CritCat or CritLib. Um, I've had great luck on Twitter asking questions and getting, and you know, answering questions. Um, and there are folks on there who will boost your question if you have tagged it with either of these tags. So they know to watch out for those. So you can get a bigger audience maybe than just your own Twitter followers. Um, there is a critical cataloging Google group. This, the creation of this actually came out of the CAA Reacts talk I gave about this topic when I was first starting to think about it. Um, it's not super active, but it can become more active. Um, I'm happy to moderate more if, if people are interested, um, but that can be a good resource. Violet Fox runs the Crit Cat Meet Roundups, which is um, just a roundup of monthly news about critical cataloging. It's a great resource. It's on cataloginglab.org, which is itself a great resource if anyone is wanting to formally petition Library of Congress to change any of their subject headings or add new ones. Um, it is a site where you can propose a change and seek help from like-minded folks. So it makes the process of suggesting a change, you know, not a solo activity, which is very helpful. Um, then I also include a few organizations here that were real inspirations for us, including Archives for Black Lives in Philadelphia. Um, also in Philadelphia, the Museum of Art Ethical Cataloging LibGuide, which we heavily based ours on, including um, we were very inspired by their accountability to list the different projects that they were working on. Um, the Presbyterian Historical Society's blog post, Language Matters, is incredibly helpful and includes a link to their mapping of a harmful legacy term to the new term that they have selected. And as we've mentioned multiple times during this presentation, we think Homosaurus is a really great example of a community created vocabulary that is very helpful if you feel like your current LGBTQIA plus terms are a little too limited by Library of Congress. Um, and lastly, an article we both really like is the Indigenization of Knowledge Organization at the Weewa Library. Um, I definitely recommend following the Wewa Library's work. They have been real leaders in Indigenous-led, Indigenous knowledge organization. Um, and these, you know, this book list was very helpful to me as I was getting started. This is not an exhaustive list of books about or related to this topic, um, but is a great starting point if you're looking for one or if you're looking for a specific topic. But at the Q&A, we would love to hear your all's resources that you have and love. Um, and we're also looking forward to answering any of your questions. So thank you all so much. Thank you.